Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth, and we do receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for all that you're accomplishing through it. We'll take hold of it, be a doer of it, see the fruit of it in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. We began sharing with you this morning on the subject of qualities necessary to be protected in the day of the Lord. We must come in line with God's word if we are going to see his protection. We begin where we began this morning in John 17, verse 15. Jesus praying to the Father, he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. We're not leaving the world. We're going to be kept from the evil. Now, this is not automatic for every Christian. The reason we know this is because this word about keeping him from evil it is a subjunctive mood verb. The subjunctive mood, whenever you see that mood, is a mood expressing something that is conditional upon conditions being met. Therefore, if you and I meet the conditions, then he will keep us from the evil. And as we walk in line with the word, we have that a confidence that he will do this. And so that's why it's so important to understand all the qualities that are necessary according to the word so we will be right with him and we can be protected in the day of the Lord. A couple other scriptures we looked at this morning to begin with in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. Keeping the word, that's what shows you're following him. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which will come upon all the inhabited earth. This is, this is not the word for world. The inhabited earth, it's coming on everybody to try them that dwell upon the earth, to test them, to see whether or not they're going to choose the way of the Lord or not. He's visiting all nations. He's going to find out who's going to follow him and who is not going to follow him. He's shaking all nations, as we saw. We'll look at that scripture again over in Hegehi. Chapter 2, in verse 6, chapter 2 that is, verse 6, Well, thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it's a little while, I will shake the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land. A great shaking is coming. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations, which is Jesus is coming to every nation, shall come. And I will fill this house with glory. That is the end time church. is going to be filled with the glory of God. And remember, that glory will be a greater one than the former. Verse 9, the glory of the latter house, that's the end time church, will be greater than of the former. Saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace, shalom. Everything that you have needed, the total salvation of the Lord will come forth. Now, another scripture we looked at that we must understand, we must understand that in the midst of all the things that are going on, God will deliver us from anything that is a coming if we will walk in his ways. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, a highly misunderstood scripture because people have not looked at this correctly. To wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. This is used by people to say, see, we're going to be gone when the wrath shows up. He delivered us from the wrath to come. That's not what it says in the Greek. The word delivered is not a past tense verb. It is a present tense, meaning who is delivering us, showing the ongoing work. From the wrath and to come looks like an infinitive but it's not an infinitive in the Greek. Instead, it's a participle, which is translated as Young's brings it out because it's present tense that is coming. In other words, he who is delivering us continually from the wrath that is continually coming. Whatever comes, he will deliver us as we walk in the ways of the Lord. And one other scripture that we looked at to begin with this morning that we need to look again at is Luke 21. In verse 36, commands unto you and me, watch, be watching continually, therefore, and pray also, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. 
Well, this means we have to meet conditions, obviously. Because again, this is a subjunctive mood conditional statement. That we may be accounted worthy if we meet the conditions to escape, flee out of, flee away from, seek safety in flight. The things that are, shall, that are coming to pass. The word shall is a present tense indicating something that is coming to pass, is going to be happening. And uh, the word come to pass is another uh, Greek word, and it also is in the present tense infinitive. Otherwise, it is going more or less. This is really saying all things that are, because it's a talk about ongoing work in the present, that are going, from that standpoint, are going to come to pass, to be coming to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Well, these things are going to come. They aren't going to go away. They're going to come to pass. And we need to be accounted worthy to escape all the things that will be happening. We looked at many things this morning. We're not going to go back over any of those. We're going to pick up where we, over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. If you and I are going to be in the position to escape all the things that are coming, then therefore we need to be following the way of the Word of God and living according to His Word, which means obedience in our life. 2 Corinthians 2.9 For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you. Uh, what's the proof of what we're really like? Whether you be obedient in all things. Obedience shows whether we're really following Him. And that's the proof of us. If we're obedient in all things, then that, that proves the fact that, hey, we passed the test. We are doing the things that he says and walking in all the ways of the Lord, which is what he wants. He's looking for us to come to the place of being obedient in all things in our life. Put the word first place. Be ready to do it at all times. We come to Matthew chapter 22. And one of the things we have to realize is that at the end of this time of the wrath and the being poured out, then Jesus is going to come back and catch us up to meet him in the, meet the Lord in the air. And then the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to happen in heaven. We see in Matthew chapter 21, it speaks here, we'll pick up in verse 9. This is after, we'll go back here for a minute, that the wedding was ready and they which were bidden or called, this means, were not worthy. And who's that talking about? All the Jews that were called, they didn't respond to the gospel. They continued to reject the gospel. So, he says, Go thee therefore into the highways, as many as you find, bid or call them to the marriage. He wants everybody to come to the marriage, because he wants everybody to be saved and be with him. So the servants went out in the highways, gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. You don't have to be a certain way to be invited to come, everybody gets invited, whether you're bad or good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. But when you come, you do have to do something. You can't stay in that state that you're in. As he goes on and says, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. If you're coming to a wedding, you've got to put the wedding garment on. Well, when this talks about had not on a wedding garment, we've got to look at this for a moment. The word on is the word enduo, which means to be clothed with something, clothing one's self. And this happens to be a middle voice verb, which means the subject, which is the person or us, a man, is to do this for himself, for his own benefit. Otherwise, he is to clothe himself with this wedding bar garment. And what's the wedding garment? That's that which is clean and holy and righteous, pure, cleansed, perfect, perfected. That's what God wants for every one of us. And notice, he had not done this. It was expected that he had done it. The reason why is because it's a perfect tense. He saw the man which had not put on in the past, completed action in the past, with present results at the time of speaking, which is what the perfect tense means, the wedding garment. He hadn't done it. You and I are to work out our own salvation. 
We're to put off the old man, put on the new man. We're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, in fact. And that's putting him on. You're going to be holy. You're going to have the wedding garment. Now you're going to be righteous before the Lord. In fact, we even see a scripture over in Romans chapter 13. Talking about this. About the putting on. But put on. Same word in duo. Same thing. The fact that it's a middle voice. So you're supposed to do it for yourself. And this time it's an imperative mood, which means it's a command. And what are we supposed to, what are we commanded that we're to put on for ourselves? The Lord Jesus Christ. How do you put the Lord Jesus Christ on? Through the Word in you. He is the Word. The Word will change you and transform you. It'll do everything in your life. And make not any provision or forethought, this means, for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. No. We are not going to walk in any of the ways of the flesh. So we go back to Matthew 22. The man had not put on a wedding garment. Yeah, that's not good. That meant he was not cleansed. That means he did not put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not white and righteous and clean before him. No. He said to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? He was speechless. He said the king, the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's not going to be there at the wedding. He may have come as the one who was invited, but he didn't do what was necessary to be able to stay and to be a part of the wedding. He gets cast out. That shows us the fact that we're all invited, but we need to come and then let him have his way to do his work in us. And you and I have a part to play because we're the ones that put on this wedding garment. We put on and clothe ourselves with it. As we do this, then, of course, we'll be right before him. And where we even see this is over in Revelation 19, verse 7, when it says, Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready that's what our part is, to make ourselves ready. To her was granted she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Otherwise, we must come to the place of being righteous. Clean, cleansed, pure, white, shining. Now that means we've come to the place of conquering all sin, overcoming everything that would spot us, Remember, we're going to be without spot, without wrinkle, unrebukable, unreprovable. This is the work that Jesus Christ will do in our life as we walk in all of his ways. So, if we're going to be protected, certainly we've got to be in the place where we put the wedding garment on. Those are the ones that are going to be protected and make it to the wedding, of course. We see over in Matthew now. In Matthew chapter 24, here's where Jesus had gone out, departed from the temple, his disciples were showing him all these buildings, and he said quite a startling statement to them. There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. He was telling them what was going to happen, which was the destruction of that temple because of them continually offering up those sacrifices because they rejected the sacrifice of Jesus. And then he comes to verse 4. And he answered and said, Take heed that no man deceive you. In fact, this is, there were three questions that were brought up here. He talked about when shall these things be? When's this temple going to be destroyed? And it talks about that here. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end, the completion, the full end of the age? Not world, it's the word aeon, meaning of the age, of the New Testament age. So he says, Take heed that no man deceive you. Deception is the mark of the last days. We must guard ourselves from deception. Of course, he says that no man might deceive you. It doesn't mean you're going to be deceived automatically. You would have to give place to it. That's why it's a subjunctive mood, that you might be deceived. No man might deceive you. That means we don't have to be deceived. We can walk in the truth, and as long as we put the word first place, we will not be deceived if we are obedient to it. 
He says, many will come in my name and say, I'm Christ, and shall deceive many. Deception. Hearing of wars, rumors of wars, don't be troubled, all these things must come to pass, the end's not yet. Talks about the nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, he says. Well, you come down to verse 11, and he says, Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. False prophets again. One of the marks of the last days is false prophets and false teachers. That's why we've got to be on guard from any things that we would receive. We've got to make sure it's in line with the Word of God. Or we're not going to be protected if we get deceived by fa false teachings and lies that come forth. So he goes on and he also says, because iniquity shall abound. The word iniquity is the Greek word anomia, which means without law or lawlessness. Nomos is law, A means without. So this is talking about being lawless. Because lawlessness shall abound, increase and just be abounding. The love of many shall wax cold. We can even see that happening beginning even in these days, the lawlessness. We even see that of our so-called leaders that are lawless, that are liars and deceivers, and they don't do things that are right whatsoever. Lawlessness abounding. Notice, it's not just talking about it affecting the world because it says the love of many shall wax cold. Who's this talking about? Well, the word for love is the word agape love. Does the world have the agape love? No. Who has the agape love? Believers have the agape love. This is talking about Christians. The love of many shall wax cold. Well, you know, the lukewarm gets spewed out of the mouth. What's going to happen to the cold? They're not going to get anywhere. They're going to get destroyed. They're not going to see. They're not going to pass the test. You and I must make sure, of course, our love is to stay for the Lord, loving Him by keeping His commandments and walking in line with His Word consistently. But this is all because of lawlessness abounding. Well, this means someone is with not doing the law. And what law are we under, by the way? Are we under law in the New Testament? Some people think, no, we're under grace, we're not under law. They fail to understand what that means. That means we're not under the Old Testament, but we are under the New Testament. But is there law in the New Testament? There sure is. It's changed. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12 says, For the priesthood being changed, which it was, from the priesthood after the order of Aaron to now the priesthood after the Melchizedek, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Not a doing away of law. It's a change of the law. So there is law. What law are we under now? Well, we're under the law of Christ. It is a higher law. It's made for man after the Spirit. Bear you one another's burden, so fulfill the law of Christ. And it's also a law that will bring great victory in our life as we walk in it, because it's called the perfect law of liberty. If we look under the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, not being a forgetful for hearer, but a doer of the work, we'll be blessed in our deed. At the same time, this law does judge us, you know. We know that because of James 2, verse 12. Speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Every one of us will be judged by the New Testament law. So, as we see the fact that lawlessness, what does that mean? They're not walking according to New Testament law anymore. They're just walking according to the flesh or the world or whatever way they want to walk. Well, that's not going to work. You and I must follow the Word of God and be obedient to the laws of Christ. Because of lawlessness abound, the love of many is going to even not get lukewarm, it's going to get cold, like it's dead. That means they're going to be walking in the ways of righteousness. This is certainly, certainly a pic picture of the fall-away group that apostatizes and that turns away from the Lord because they don't walk after the Word any longer. What happens to those that are lawless? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, this is where Jesus said, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that are work that work 
and anemia, lawlessness. They're told to part. And what's the deal here? These guys are working lawlessness continually. It's the present tense. That's why Young's translates it correctly, who are working lawlessness. That means they're not walking after the Word of God any longer. They're walking after their own ways. Now, people have said, what's this thing about I never knew you? Well, that must talk about somebody of the world since he never knew them. No, it's not talking about that. The reason is because if we go back here to verse 21 and following, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Just because you say and you call him Lord doesn't mean you're entering in. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The word do is present tense again. The one who's doing it consistently is doing the will of my Father. The what's the guy is walking in the word consistently in it. That's what's important. Then he goes on to the next one and says, many, remember we've seen the many. We talked about it this morning. The many are the ones that are walking the broad way to destruction. The many are the ones that want to enter in and they couldn't enter in because they didn't have any might or strength or force. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and thy name cast out devils and thy name done many wonderful works? Well, what does that tell you? These are Christians. Many people, pastors, teachers, Bible school teachers, Bible school presidents, and so forth, have said, these guys couldn't have been born again. This isn't talking about anybody that was born again. Why do they say that? Because he said, I never knew you. But they fail to understand what that means. Because let's look at this. Were these guys born again? You better believe they were. Can you prophesy in his name if you're not born again and have the Holy Spirit in you? If you don't, no. They had the Holy Spirit in them, they were born again, and they were prophesying in his name. Cast out demons. Can anybody cast out demons if you're not born again? No. Remember the seven sons of Sceva tried to do it and they got wiped out, you know? No, you can't do it. In my name done many wonderful works. This is talking about Christians. So these are guys that were doing this. Notice the past tense, have prophesied have cast out, have uh, d uh, done all these wonderful works. That's what they did in the past. Were they continuing to do that in the past? That what they'd done in the past? No. They quit and they turned away. Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Why is that? Because of what they were doing continually at that point in time, which was working lawlessness. That means these guys were in the fallaway crowd. These guys apostatized. And they can't say what they did in the past if you're not continually following the Lord today. God knows us by what we are doing consistently in our life. We ought to look at something else that helps to understand this. Many people have had a hard time understanding this. But it's not difficult when we understand how God views a person. We see over here in Ezekiel 18, we pick up in verse 21. If the wicked will turn from all his sins that he's committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Otherwise, he was walking in sin, now he's not, now he's walking right, he's following the way of the Lord. Hi, he's going to live. That's good. All his transgressions that he's committed, all those things in the past that he, not committing anymore, but he did, they shall not be mentioned. The word means remembered. He won't remember them because when we confess our sins, we repent and turn from God. He doesn't remember our sins anymore because we met the conditions. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Well, that's great. Well, God is fair and just, isn't he? Well, look at verse 24. When the righteous turneth away from his righteousness. Well, that was someone who was walking in the way of righteousness. He was doing the word consistently. And now he's committing iniquity. He's not following the word any longer. And doing according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth. Shall he live? No. Read on. All his righteousness, all those things he did in the past, that he hath done shall not be, same word, remembered. 
it's as if they never were. Just like the sins, it was as if they never were before, the transgressions, well, it's as his righteousness was never, uh, ever was. He says, all his righteousness that he has done shall not be remembered. In his trespass that he's trespassed, in his sin that he's sinned, in them shall he die. That means God knows us by whatever we're walking after consistently in our life. That's why he says to these ones who were walking after the way of the Lord, depart from me, you who are working lawlessness. This is why we must maintain walking in the ways of the Lord. Well, we see the fact that those ones that don't follow the way of the Lord, they're going to be in the fallaway group. They're going to be in the apostatizing group that will not obey what the Lord wants for them to do. He expects us to walk in His ways. And of course, are we going to be able to stand victorious and, and be protected in the day of the Lord? When these things are occurring, if we're not walking right, no way. It's not going to happen. Remember, who are the righteous? Those who are born again and doing the word of righteousness. 1 John 3, 7, little children, let no man deceive you. Remember, it talked about the false prophets, the false teachers deceiving. This is one of the areas where people have been deceived, even today, in the body of Christ. The prevailing teaching in the body of Christ is that once you're born again, you're perfectly righteous because you get a brand new spirit on the inside of you. That is not true. How do we know? He said, don't let anybody deceive you about this subject. God's speaking to this in his foreknowledge. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He didn't say the guy who was born again is righteous, even as he is righteous. No, it's the one who is doing righteousness, present tense, ongoing action, showing you get born again and then you're still going to be doing something. Can you be walking in the ways of sin continually and think that you're righteous? No, it's what you're doing consistently that's the key. And another scripture we've looked at, though, which is quite a scripture. In this, the children of God are manifest in the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness, again, present tense, is not continually doing righteousness, is not of God. That is quite a statement. But that's what God says. That's the way he views things, not the way man views things. Neither he that loveth not his brother. If he's not loving his brother continually, uh, he's, he's, not, he's not right either. We even know from down here in verse 14, we know we pass from death into life because we love the brethren, but he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Well, if he's abide in death, is he going to be protected? No, he's going to be wiped out. And whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That's because we've got to be walking in the ways of the Lord. And that's what he expects. We go back over to Matthew 24. You must understand that these false prophets that are coming forth and the false teachers that are going forth, they're going to be deceiving many, as it talked about. Matthew 24, 24, there shall rise false Christ, false prophets, shall show great signs and wonders, as much as are possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Deception is the mark of the last days. Who will be able to stand victorious? The ones who know the word, are hearing the word, doing the word and will not be deceived by anything that comes to them because they'll look at the word and they'll know what the truth is. We cannot listen to any of these ones that are going to show forth or give, merely means give, signs and wonders about things and speak these different things and declare things that are going to come to pass. Uh, no. These ones, they could even deceive the very elect. That's why, of course, we tell you, don't ever follow signs and wonders. Because remember, that's how what's going to happen. The Antichrist is going to do signs and wonders, lying signs and wonders. And if you follow that, you're going to think that, hey, this is the real deal. When it's not, it's deception. We cannot allow that to happen. And we would be deceived. We must be on guard and make sure we check everything out in line with the word. Those people that are not deceived, they're the ones that they will be protected. 
The ones that deceive, they're going to end up following the wrong path. And we, we'll jump over to this for a moment, that's 2 Thessalonians 2, where it talks about the verse 9, talking about the Antichrist, even him who after, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. He's going to be manifesting powerful things and signs and lying wonders. People that are following that are going to be easily deceived, are going to easily be in the fall away group. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that are perishing, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved or for their being saved, if we don't receive the love of the truth and put the word first place, we're in trouble. Everybody's got to get the word established in them. And because of the fact that they're going to buy into what the Antichrist says and go along with the unrighteous way, for this cause, cause God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that he is the real deal. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. That they all might be damned or judged, this means, who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Because he's going to say, you can do anything you want. Unrighteousness? Yeah, there isn't any unrighteousness. It doesn't matter what you do. Lawlessness doesn't matter what you do. Do anything. <laughs> no. Those people that walk in unrighteousness, they are going to go down. You and I must make sure. It's only the righteous are going to come through victorious. That's absolutely essential. We also see another thing. If you are going to be prepared and be able to come through these last days, we see over in Matthew 24, another place, Verse 42. Watch you therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord hath come. Hour? We don't know the hour he's going to come. He said, Know this, if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be also ready. This means prepared and ready. For in such an hour you think not the Son of Man cometh. It means we've got to be prepared and ready. If we're not prepared and ready, then we're not going to be able to stand victorious in what's coming. Who's a faithful and wise servant whom the Lord has made ruler over his household and given meat in due season? Blessed is that servant when his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. We need to be faithful. We need to be wise servants serving the Lord. Those are the ones that will be made rulers, and of course, those are the ones that are going to be protected. We come over to chapter 25, and we see something that's important as well. In Matthew 25, here's where it talks about the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which, took, virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. What is oil for? So you have light in you. Your lamps will be lighted, be able to be lit. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So that meant they had the source that would produce that which would be light in them. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Well, this is talking about when Jesus comes, he's the bridegroom coming for the bride, the church, to catch it up to meet the Lord in the air. All those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are not gone out. It literally says, are going out, because it's a present tense. Well, that means that they didn't have what was necessary for their lamps to continually be lit, which is what? The Word in you. Those who are prepared and ready have the Word in them. They're walking in the Word, and these ones didn't have it. So their lamps are going out because they didn't have that which would produce light, and the light is the Word of God that must be in us. And of course, the wise answer said, Not so lest there be not enough for us. But you go rather to send them that sell and buy for yourselves. Everybody has to get what's necessary for themselves. And what are we supposed to be buying? Well, we see over in Proverbs. 
talks about in chapter 23, down here in verse 23, by the truth. Now we got to buy the truth. What's the truth? The word. What does that mean? It's going to cost you something, isn't it? It's going to cost you time, effort. It's going to cost you getting in the word of God, hearing it, doing it, studying it out, allowing God to accomplish this thing and work in your life as you hear and do the word. We got to buy it, which means to acquire it or obtain it, possess it, get it for ourselves. Everybody has got to get the word of God in them. What do we see was the problem here in Matthew 25? Well, the problem was one group had done what was necessary to get what was necessary so that they would have light in their lamps. But the other group uh, did not. So this is, of course, so notice what it says. Oh, they went to buy, and the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with them to the marriage, and the door was shut. Only those that were prepared and ready went in. Well, they're obviously going to be the only ones that are going to be protected. The rest of the ones are not going to be protected because they don't, their light is going out because they don't have the word in them. Oh, well, they came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. He answered, and verily I say unto you, I know you not. Remember we've talked about? Who does God know? He knows those who are walking in line with his ways at any point in time. These people, they, had let, they were not walking in the ways of the word any longer because that's why they didn't have the word. Their, the lamps were going out because they did not have what was necessary in them. Watch you therefore, you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. These guys were not prepared and ready. We must be prepared and ready so that we are going to see God bring forth what he purposes. We see also in Matthew chapter 25, coming down to verse 26. His Lord answered and said, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest where I reap, where I sowed not. He said, Gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers. Then at my coming, I should have received my own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it to him that hath ten talents. Every one that hath, for to, unto every one that hath shall be given, and he that hath, he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. It's quite a statement. If you don't have what you need to have, you're just going to be taken away. What do we need to have? We need to have the word in us. They needed to have that which would produce the oil in them that would produce the light. They didn't have it. We need to have the things in us that God wants for us, which is the Word of God in us, walking in His ways. And so what happened then? Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's obviously not going to be protected. In fact, he's not even going to be saved because he's not following the way of the Lord. We also see over in Mark chapter 9, talking about those people that are going to be protected and what's going to be necessary. This is quite a passage of Scripture. In Mark chapter 9, verse 43, he says, If thy hand offends thee, cut it off. What would your hand do? Your hand could sin. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. And then he said, where the worm, worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, your walk. You now you're not walking right. Cut it off. It's better for thee to enter halt into life and for having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thine eye offend thee, you've got to watch your eye. You can't let your eye be seeing things and, and doing things that are sinful. Pluck it out. It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Those are our members, aren't they? Our hands, our feet, and our eyes, what we see. We've got to make sure we're only yielding our members unto God and that we're not yielding our members unto sin. Of course, does he want us to, you know, uh, cut off our hand or any of these things? No. What he wants us to do 
is to cut out the sin out of our life and make sure we're only yielding our members to what is right. If we don't yield our members to what's right, we're going to be yielding unto sin. We'll be actually yielding to the devil. We know this from over in Romans chapter 6. In verse 13, Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. That's what we'd be doing. But yield yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of, of righteousness unto God. And then verse 16 tells us, Know ye not? We need to know this. To whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. What's the end result of sin? Death. Are we going to be protected if we're walking in sin? No. But if we're obedient, walking in his word, then we're going to be shown to be righteous and the righteous are the ones who are going to be protected in these last days. We need to make sure we're only following the way of the Lord. Another thing that we see over in Mark, chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, we pick up over here in verse 35. He says, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even. That would be from six to nine at night. At midnight, that's from nine to twelve, the second watch. The cock crowing, that's the third watch of the night, which is from twelve to three a.m. Or in the morning, which is the word referring to the fourth watch, from three to six. He's talking about what hour when he might come. And which one day or the other, depending upon when it is, we're supposed to watch. Lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. We can't be asleep. We can't be lazy or slothful or not being aware of what's going on. He commands us to be watching. I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. People that will not watch, they'll easily be deceived. Spiritually, you're to be watching and being attentive because God will show you what to do. He'll lead you step by step and make sure you're walking in the right path, of course. And we need to be not giving place. You know, if you watch and pray, you won't enter into temptation. You will follow the way of the Lord. You'll overcome whatever situation comes against you in your life. Another thing that's important is we need to be operating in faith. Because it's interesting what he says in Luke 18, verse 8. If we're going to be protected... Who's going to be protected? The ones who are operating in faith. Luke 18, 8, we tell you he'll avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Because the one who has faith, he, that's what gives the victory. And that one on, who is walking by faith, he's going to be overcoming whatever attacks will come. And remember, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And your faith shows you're believing and you're trusting in him. And he is going to accomplish his great work in your life. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. We saw 36, but we first want to look at verse 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, oh, this is someone drinking wine to excess, or drunkenness. This means intoxication of any kind, actually. It's the word methe, where we get meth from. Methe, intoxication. And cares or anxieties of this life, so that day come upon you unawares. You know, if you're full of something that causes you not to be watching or aware of things, then what's going to happen? You're not going to be ready whatsoever. You're going to be walking in the ways of sin. And cares and worries and anxieties of this life, of the affairs of this life it's talking about. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus, not be moved by all the things that are going on in the world. You can't be, you're going to be caught up in that. It's going to bring care, worry, anxiety upon you. And then you will not be ready for the day that's coming. For as a snare it shall come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch you therefore pray and pray always, as we already saw this, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. Now, if you're not 
right with him, you're not going to be able to escape all these things. You're full of worry and anxiety. You're going to hear his voice. You're going to be ready to follow the way he wants or flee out of things. No, you're going to end up being taken down by these problems that are going to be happening. John chapter 12, we see something else. Those people who are going to come through victorious and pass the test, remember the test is coming to everybody, the entire inhabited earth. John 12, verse 48, He that rejecteth me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The word that I've spoken, same shall judge him in the last day. What we do with the word of God is the key. We must do the word because the word is going to judge us. That's why being a hearer and a doer of the word consistently is so important. And if we're not, then we're going to be seeing judgment will come and will not be protected. In Romans chapter 1, we saw this verse before, but we'll look at it again. It was in the morning we saw it. Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, hold back is what it means, or are holding down the truth in unrighteousness because they're walking in sin. Notice it's revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Well, that means anybody that's walking in unrighteousness, which is sin, anybody that's walking in ungodly ways, uh, the wrath of God's going to hit them. It doesn't matter whether you're born again or you're not born again. It all matters what you are walking after. That is the key. So, people that think that it doesn't matter what I'm doing after I'm born again, they're in for a rude awakening because the wrath of God is going to be revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. We come down to verse 21. Because that when they knew God, these are people that knew God at one point, they glorified Him not as God. They weren't thankful. They became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Again, if we don't continue to follow the way of the Lord, be obedient to Him and glorify Him and be thankful unto Him, what's going to happen? Well, they became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart got darkened. And of course, they thought they were wise, but they became fools instead. Changed the image of the glory of the, the corrupt, incorruptible God, uncorruptible God, into an image made to corruptible man. How deceived can you get? Them think God's like a bird or four footed beast or creeping things, but they did. They did so just totally deceived. Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts and dishonor of their own bodies between them. This is how the people got into homosexuality. And they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature, that's themselves, more than the Creator. Otherwise, they quit following the Word of God. They quit following the way of the Lord. What a mistake. Someone that doesn't do that, they're not going to be protected. They're going to get taken down instead. God gave them up to the vile affections, and this is when they got in their homosexuality. Notice verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. They didn't want to have the knowledge of God. We got to have the knowledge of God. Without the knowledge of God, we're sunk. They didn't want to retain the knowledge of God. And so what happens if you do not accept the word, if you reject the word, if you walk in your own ways, well, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's a mind that's not approved to do those things that are not convenient. And then they start doing all these evil things because God will give you over to something if you do not follow His way. He'll let you do what you want. It's not His will at all, but nonetheless, He's not going to make you choose right. They didn't want God's knowledge. Okay, you got an unapproved mind, and they went and did all these evil things. We must make sure that we are following ourselves with the way of the Word of God, or what's going to happen? We're going to end up getting judged. That's what happened these guys got. They got filled with all unrighteousness of all types. Fornication, wickedness, covetous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, all kinds of evil stuff. Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, which means they won't, um, these guys won't, their, their word's no good. They're, they're like without a treaty or a covenant. Unmerciful. Uh, they're not merciful to anybody at all. 
knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such, thing, such things are worthy of death, not only do they do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. Sounds like some of the crazy people today that are doing evil things, doesn't it? They got reprobate minds because they've rejected the way of the Lord. And they even have pleasure in doing their evil things. This is going to increase as we go down these days. Chapter 2. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, you condemn yourself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things. And we can't be judging people. We've got to be sure that we're dealing with ourselves. We're sure the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Thinkest thou this, O man, which judge them which do such things and does the same? Yeah, that's wrong, and yet you're doing the same thing. <laughs> you're in trouble. Shall you escape the judgment of God? No, that's why you can't be critical and judgmental and negative of others. You pray for them, you encourage them to do the right thing, and you make sure you're cleaning your act up. Not that you're going to be critical of others and yet do the same thing. Despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing the goodness of God, leads us to repentance. That's what he wants. He wants repentance in our life, change, so we don't walk in the ways of, of darkness any longer. Of course, anyone who hasn't repented, are they going to be protected? No. But after the hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up to thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. God's judgment is righteous. This is the revelation of the wrath on the day of wrath. Why? They have hardness and unpenitent heart, meaning an unrepentant heart. We can't have a hard heart. We can't have an unrepentant heart. We can't have an unforgiving heart. We can't have any kind of negative attitudes in our heart. You got to let everything go. Do not allow any evil things to get a hold of you in your heart. You are to have a perfect heart that is right with God at all times. Well, he's going to render every man according to his deeds. And to them who by patient continuance or steadfastness in doing well, good works is what this literally means. This is the word for good. This is the word for work. That's why he translated a good work. For glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. So what should we be doing if we're going to be protected? We're going to be doing good, good works. We're going to be steadfast in doing the things that God wants us. Those are the ones that are they're seeking for glory, honor, immortality, and eternal life. But how about the one who's contentious and does not obey the truth? Hmm. Remember the disobedient? They're in trouble. But obey unrighteousness. What's going to happen to them? Indignation and wrath. Are they going to get protected? No. Obedience is mandatory. You choose to obey it doesn't matter what you feel like. It doesn't matter what so-and-so did to you or didn't do to you. It doesn't matter what situation's going on. You obey the Word of God, period. You do what it says, to do what is right in the sight of the Lord. They're going to get tribulation. They're going to get anguish on every soul of men that doeth evil. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good. Otherwise, whatever you're doing consistently is what you're going to be reaping. And of course, that shows whether you're walking right with him or not. We come over to Romans chapter 11 in verse 20. What happened to the Jews? Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And now stand us by faith. That means we're now walking by faith, and that's good. Be not high-minded, but fear. Don't think that, oh, I'm better than the other person. Don't be high-minded, but keep the fear of the Lord before you. He goes on and says, If God spared not the natural branches, which were the Jews, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them that fell severity, the Jews. Look what happened to them. They got spread throughout the earth. <laughs> They didn't have a nation until 1948 because of the curse that was upon them. They couldn't have one. And here they had all these problems forever. And toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And nobody's above being possibly cut off. That's why we're going to walk the walk. You walk in line with his ways. You be obedient unto him. 
then you are continuing in his goodness and then you will be with the Lord. You'll be protected in these days. Anybody that will not walk in line with the word of God, he's going to be in a position where he will not be protected when the wrath is being poured out. Because it's, remember, it's poured out against all unrighteousness and all ungodliness. It doesn't matter what your, your status has been. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We pick up over in verse 6. Now this is the case where the man was having incestual relations with his father's wife, and they didn't do anything about it. They just let it go by. He's, he comes to him, he says, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Well, that's a principle that's important. The leaven of this man's sin was contaminating the whole group. Well, it's true in us as well. Leaven is a type of sin. A little sin leavens, contaminates the whole lump. It contaminates us. That's why we got to get rid of all the areas of sin in our life. Purge out. Cleanse out. Cleanse thoroughly. If you're going to be in a position where you're going to be protected, you're going to get cleansed out. Remember we talked about the one who's cleansed out in 2 Timothy chapter 2, who becomes a vessel of honor because he's been sanctified, because he purged himself, cleansed out everything. Talked about that this morning. Purge out, cleanse out, therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. Unleavened means we're, we're supposed to be one walking free from sin. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So he says, therefore, let us keep the feast. What feast is he talking about? The feast of unleavened bread. How do we keep the feast? Do we keep him in a physical way, just observing a day? No. Because Jesus is the fulfillment, fulfillment of that. He fulfilled the first four. We keep it in the personal application of what he's accomplished in our life, declaring what he did for us, but also all the things that it speaks of in each feast in our own life. And in this case, Unleavened bread is getting rid of the leaven. What did Jesus do? He got rid of the sin, bore it away for three days and three nights. What are you supposed to do in your life? Get rid of the sin out of you. Get cleansed. Let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of purity, sincerity, sincerity, and genuineness, is what this means, and truth. Otherwise, we're going to clean up and we're going to walk in the truth. That's how you keep unleavened bread. Not keeping some day. <laughs> that doesn't do anything. That's what people do, unfortunately, that are deceived today still. No. Instead, the spiritual application. Get rid of all the sin out of your life in every area. That is how we keep it. He goes on and says, I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators. Well, that means we don't have fellowship with fornicators. Well, it doesn't matter who it is either. Might even be a, a relative or whatever all. We're not going to have company with fornicators or it's going to contaminate you. He goes on and says, Yet not altogether are the fornicators of this world or the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Then you must needs go out of the world. But now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man is called a brother. Well, not only is it talking about people of the world, but how about people that are in the church? Like in this case, he was a fornicator. Or covetous, or idolater, or a railer, or drunkard, or extortioner. With such a one you don't even eat. Because you get contaminated. That's why a little leaven will contaminate you. That's why the fact that he even talks about, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, down in verse 33, Be not deceived. Evil companionships, this means, corrupts the good manners, the good things in your life. It'll, it'll have an adverse effect upon you. You'll get a transfer of spirits for ungodly ties with people that aren't walking right. No. We're going to follow the way of the Lord. We're not going to compromise. We're going to preach the gospel to those people and call them to repentance, encourage them to do right, but we're not going to be in fellowship with them. If we're going to be in companionship and fellowship with them and communion with them, it is going to corrupt us. I see many Christians will not take a stand 
regarding staying pure in their relationships and even in their fellowships with people. And they wonder why they have problems. They get contaminated because they're fellowshipping with people that are not walking right. That's not saying we don't have contact with people. Jesus was ate with the, the, the publicans and the sinners and the, all the ones that were evil, you know. What did he do? He preached the gospel to them. He called them, called them to repentance. That's what we do. Because we're here to minister to people and help them come to repentance. We certainly can't be having fellowship, though, just buddying around with people that are not walking right. It will have a contaminating effect upon you in your life. God does not want that whatsoever. We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we pick up here in verse 9. He says, Know ye not the unrighteousness shall not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, we know the unrighteous, they're not going to be protected in the day of the Lord. Not only that, they're not even going to inherit the kingdom of God. They're going to be sunk. Be not deceived. The fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind is homosexuals. Notice below, one who lies with a male is with a female, a sodomite. <laughs> they're not, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Nor the thieves, nor the covetous, nor the drunkards, or intoxicators, or the revilers, the extortioners. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. It's interesting what it says after that. But such were some of you. Does that mean they were doomed? No. They could get deal with that. It says, you are washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Well, how did all that happen? You got to, if without looking at the tense of the verbs, you'll never figure it out. Because the word washed means they did something for their own benefit, because it's a middle voice. They washed themselves, essentially. They washed, they got themselves washed by what? Doing what the Word says, confessing their sin, repenting, turning away from it, putting off the old man, getting rid of these evil things out of their life. And then what was the result? Because they got, they washed, they cleaned up. But you're sanctified. Now who makes us sanctified? The Lord, not them, because it's a passive voice this time. God does this work of sanctification because you cleaned up and you got rid of all the filth. And of course, if you get rid of that, you're going to be walking in line with the Word. And they were sanctified. And then they were justified. Declared righteous, this means rendered righteous, by the Lord. Why? Because they were now walking right. That's what God wants. Whatever things in the past, what's your job? Get this stuff out of your life. Get it washed off. Get rid of it all. As you do so and you walk in line with the Word, God will produce the sanctification and the declaring of righteousness in your life, and you will be holy and righteous before Him. And those are the ones that are going to be protected in the day of the Lord. You may have had a history of some bad stuff in the past. Well, it's a new day if you have confessed your sin, and now if you're walking in the way of the Lord, you follow Him, you will be in the position to inherit the kingdom of God because you now come to the place of being washed, sanctified, and justified by the Lord. We also see any of the works of the flesh. One of the things that you and I must do is we must deal successfully with the flesh. You have this flesh. Sin dwells in the flesh. You've got to deny yourself and crucify the flesh daily. In fact, we'll look at that first. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. This is what Jesus said. He said to them all, if any man wills to come, literally is what it says. The word will is a word, and the word come is a word. The word will is the main verb. If he sets his will continually, present tense. He's willing and continually willing. Come is a infinitive. Infinitive in the Greeks, just like infinitive in English, to come. 
That's why Jung translates it good. That's why I have this up here all the time. He did a good job on the Greek. If anyone is continually willing to be coming after him, to come after him, and that's what we got to do. Set our will. We're going to follow after the way of the Lord. Well, there's something you need to do. Let him deny himself. We've got to deny ourselves first and take up his cross daily. What's the cross? Where something's put to death. What's supposed to be put to death daily? The deeds of the body. You mortify the deeds of the body daily. You put to death the deeds of the body so sin does not operate through the flesh and take you into unrighteousness. And then, of course, follow me by putting the Word of God first place in our life and do what he says. So you got this flesh warring against you. What's going to be the answer? Well, it's what you walk by that's the key. Galatians 5, 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, which would be in line with the Word, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is there. It's not going to go away. It just needs to be silenced and put under. Remember when Paul talked about how I keep under my body and I lead it, make it, I lead it away captive, make it a slave. I'm not going to let it run me whatsoever. You don't let your body dictate what you do. Your spirit is to lead that's to lead what you do. Your body, what's the voice of the body? The flesh has the voice of the, through the feelings. Can you go by your feelings and be walking in the spirit? No. You cannot follow your feelings. Too many, I hear too many Christians say, well, I don't feel this and I feel that. I want to feel this and I want to feel that. I want to feel faith and I want to feel the presence of God. I want to feel all these things. Why do you want to feel things? Walk in the way of the Word. If you have a feeling, great. If you don't have a feeling, so what? You walk in the Spirit and you'll see the results. You don't need feelings. That is looking for the flesh to be essentially manifesting. We walk in the Spirit. We will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. They're contrary or opposite or adverse to one another. If you think you're going to wake up in the morning and feel like uh, praying and feel like casting out and feel like you're going to do all these great things, a lot of times it's the last thing you feel like doing. You know, you should get in the Word. Oh, I don't feel like getting in the Word. You need to go pray for a half an hour or so. Well, I don't, you know, you got some other excuse. I don't feel like doing it. Feel, 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 feel. We can't follow the feelings. They're contrary one to another. Do not let yourself be dictated by the flesh or you're going to be walking in sin. He said, so you can't do the things that you would or what you will to do. You're willing to want to do what God wants, but the flesh will take you down. If you are always wanting the feelings, feel, 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 feel. He comes down to verse 19 and he starts talking about these works of the flesh. Again, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, all these evil things. Envyings, murders, drunkenness or intoxication, revelings. That's the party spirit. I want to go party. No, you don't want to go party. That's the worldly, fleshly stuff. And such like. Of the which I tell you, as I told you in time past, those which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Are they going to be able to be protected? No. They're going to be in the fallaway group and they're going to be ended up being taken down. And what's he want? Verse 24 says, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and its lusts. The lusts are there. Don't give place to it. You crucify that. You keep that thing underneath. But what do you do? If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And it's interesting, the word walk it's not the normal word for walk. If we go back to verse 16, this is the normal word for walk, peripateo. <clears throat> but this is the different word. This is this word, stoikeo, in the Greek, which means to proceed in a row as a march of a soldier, go in order. In other words, order your life in line with the Word of God. Order your steps that you're going to be walking in the Spirit and do what God wants. Ah, we need to order our life. It means we're not waiting for a feeling. We're not waiting for anything. 
We're setting it order. This is what we're doing. That's what God wants. He wants you to come to get in order and walk in His ways. Praise the Lord. We also see over one other one we'll look at tonight. These are all things we've got to eliminate. If we're going to be protected, can we walk in the flesh? Can we walk in sin? Can we walk in any of these ways? No. Ephesians 5.5, 5, look what it says. This you know, no whoremonger, that's in fornicating, sexual sin, pornos, nor unclean person. A lot of people just gloss over this one. Well, what does that mean? Not cleansed. He didn't get cleansed. It's kind of like the one who didn't have the wedding garment on. He didn't get cleansed, did he? Nor covetous man, nor idolater. We know that the whoremonger, the covetous, and the dollar is no good. But what about the guy who didn't get cleansed? Ah, it meant he hasn't dealt with things in his life. Has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? That's quite a statement. What's it mean about the kingdom of Christ and of God? It's talking about the two aspects of the kingdom, which is first the kingdom of Christ, which is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, and then the kingdom of God. Well, that's talking about God the Father. What happens at the end of the millennial reign? Jesus takes the kingdom and gives it back into the hands of the Father, doesn't he? So this would speak in the eternal age of the kingdom of God. That means this person doesn't have inheritance forever. He's done if he does not deal with these things, including getting cleansed. God wants us to clean up and walk in the ways of the Lord and put the Word of God first place. If you and I are going to be protected, we're to be holy as He is holy. Remember one last scripture in 1 Peter chapter 1. But as He which hath called you is holy, he's holy, so become, the word genomai, become a command to you and me, imperative mood, holy in all, when it says manner of conversation, this doesn't mean just your talk, this means everything you do. Manner of life, conduct, behavior, everything you do. God wants us to live a holy life. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Are you going to be protected if you're not holy? No. We're commanded to be holy. Now, would God command us to be holy and not produce that in our life if we do what He says? Oh, that would be unjust, wouldn't it? He will produce it in our life if we do what He says. He will bring that forth. He says, because it's written, become holy, for I am holy. God is going to work this mighty work in your life through the Word of God. We're going to clean up. He's going to make us holy. See, we're going to, that's, that's another thing we might just point out. Many people want to get delivered, and that's great that we want to get delivered. But what's your motivation for deliverance? Just to get free of my problem? Just to feel better? Get rid of my pain? You know, get the, uh, some blessing or whatever? No. Look what it says, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. We've got to clean up, right? From what? All. Not some. All. Filthiness. Defilement means of the flesh. That's every fleshly work. But also, and spirit. What's the filthiness of the spirit? Because it modifies both. The filthiness of the spirit are the unclean spirits, the foul unclean spirits, which are the general term for demons. And what's our motivation? And what does it produce? Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Not just getting free of a problem. It's coming to the place of being holy. When our motivation's right, as you're on that route to get, for, get holy before Him, everything else will be taken care of. Your pains will get eliminated. The sickness will get eliminated. You'll get healed of everything. All hurts and wounds will be knocked out. You know, you'll be restored in your soul. You'll see the whole thing work across the board. But we've got to have the right motivation. If we got it on our terms, get rid of my pain, get rid of this problem, and so forth. That's the wrong way to approach it. 
we got to do it on God's terms. The motivation for you to get delivered and everything, all that you do is to get holy, become holy before the Lord. Praise God. He's been working to accomplish that in you and me as we put the Word of God first place. And He is mighty. His Word is powerful. And He will accomplish it. He's faithful to perform His Word in our life. And He'll do it. I said that was the last one, but I, when the one comes to me, I'll have to spring to you quickly. 1 Thessalonians 5, I want you to look at this in verse 23 and 24. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That's the whole person. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming. Oh, that's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if that's what God wants, is he going to do something about it? Yeah. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. It wouldn't be right if God called us to something and he wasn't going to perform it in our life because he's the one that performs it. We can't do it ourselves. We just have a part to play by doing the word to put him in operation so he does perform it in our life. Faithful is he that calleth you. He will do it as you obey and answer the call of God. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the great work you're accomplishing in my life. And I see all these qualities that are necessary for me to be protected in the day of the Lord as well as to come to the place of being holy and righteous, being cleansed, being right before you, inheriting the kingdom, seeing you perform all that you promised in my life. I thank you. I'm putting the word of God first place in my life. I will deny myself. I will crucify that flesh daily. I will be obedient in all things. I will do what the word says. I thank you for accomplishing your work and bringing me to the place of being righteous and holy. I will be sure that I am cleansed so that I then will go on to perfection. All filthiness of the flesh and spirit will be cleansed out of my life and I will perfect holiness in the fear of God. Thank you for performing this great work. And as you said in your word, faithful are you who called me. You will do it. And I know you'll do it as I obey your word. Thank you for doing it in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. That's a good scripture for you to keep before you at all times. Faithful is he that calls me, he will do it. Just do what he tells you to do and let him have his way. Deny yourself, get out of the way, crucify that flesh. Walk in the spirit, don't let that flesh have to do it. Order your steps like a march of a soldier. All these things, just put these scriptures in operation God will do the great and mighty work. Father, we thank you for all you accomplished. We will be hearers and doers of your word. We will see all these qualities necessary to be protected in the day of the Lord established in us. And we will see the great and mighty work completed in us. Thank you for doing this. We know you're faithful and you're going to perform it in each one of us as we meet the conditions and do what you say. Thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen.